What I want to do tonight with all of us, I want us to go back to the Word of God. Something about Christmas um, points us and tells us about who God is. It's interesting if you think about it, when, when we look at Christmas, Christmas tells us something about the person of God. And we oftentimes look at Christmas as the way that God tells us something. You know, it's interesting, uh, I was watching Christmas Vacation again, and again, and again, you know. And at the end of the movie, Chevy Chase talks about the, the spirit of Christmas, or the Christmas star, and it means something different to everybody. And that's usually how the world focuses on Christmas, is Christmas means something to me, right? It's about my truth, what it means to me. But unfortunately, that's that's not the point of, the, of Christmas at all. It's not to, to mean something individually to you. It's to actually tell us something about the person of God. Who is he? Why would he go through all of this? Uh, and, and what does that tell us about him? And we do this. You, you realize we do this uh, with everybody all the time. We look at a person. Uh, we look at what somebody does, and it tells us about them. So yesterday, I'll give you a quick illustration. Yesterday, I was uh, over by the Best Buy, you know, where the mall is there, or not the mall, the, the Target. It was five, it was about 5.30, 6 o'clock uh, yesterday afternoon. So you know if, what happens right there at that time. So me and my wife are shopping, and we pull into the, the Best Buy parking lot. And as we're pulling in from the road, all of the traffic kind of stops. So we're, we're in the parking lot area, but there's a line of cars behind us into the intersection there, and it's just packed, everybody. And I'm in the perfect spot to see why all the cars are stopped. And there is a black, beautiful Mustang. And he has, all the cars are coming this way, and we're going in this way, and the Best Buy's right over here, right? And he's pulled in and stopped right in the middle of my lane in front of about five cars in front of me, and he's just stopped there. So nobody, everybody in the intersection is piled up, and nobody can move forward. And all the cars here are stopped, and they're stuck because the light is red. And so nobody can move. We just have to all sit there while everybody in the intersection is honking and yelling and saying bad words. And you want to know what I was doing? I was honking and yelling and saying bad words at the dude in the Mustang. Not really. But my wife was there and she, it, it made me angry. Because I'm watching this guy. I'm like, why did you do that? Why did you pull out? And you know what? In that moment, I instantly knew who this guy was. I knew everything that ever, this guy, he is a bad man. He probably like kicks puppies and things like that. Like he is not nice. Why would anybody on rush hour two days before Christmas in the busiest section of Denton do this? And see, I took his actions and I judged him and I said, I know who this guy is based on what he's doing. Well, that's what we do, right? We look at a person's actions and we might figure something out about them. Every year we celebrate Christmas. Every year we do this. We get together, family, friends, presents, shopping, everything. And then we'll show up on a Christmas Eve service and we'll come to church. Have you ever stopped to answer the question, why would God do this? What does this tell me about who he must be? So that's what we're going to do tonight. So I want to approach things in four ways. We're going to look at four brief little things that I think Christmas tells us about Jesus. And the first thing is that I believe that Christmas tells us that God must have a plan. Think about it. Do you think that God sent his son to the earth randomly? Just on a whim. Just because. See, he couldn't have. There's got to be something more to it. So my, my daughter, she comes home. She goes to Denton Classical Academy. And she on Friday, they... They were, it was, uh, I can't remember what it was, but anyway, it was like they were watching movies all day or something. Great, great taxpayer money. Anyway, they were watching movies, and she comes home, and she had been watching Hercules. Remember the Disney movie Hercules? 
Well, she came home. She's like, I want to see it again. So we pull it up on Disney Plus and we start watching Hercules. And I'm watching this show. I don't know if you guys know anything about Hercules. So Hercules was the son of Zeus, according to Disney. I don't know if it's true in Greek mythology, but we're going to give you the Disney version tonight, okay? There's kids in the room, right? So Zeus was the son of, uh, excuse me, Hercules was the son of Zeus. Well, Hades was the god of the underworld, and Hades didn't like Zeus. He wanted to kill everybody, and he wanted to be the king. And so he goes to kill Hercules. And in the process of trying to, by the way, this is going to have spoiler alerts all over it. So, But the process of him trying to kill Hercules, he doesn't. He just poisons him and makes him human. So Hercules, who was a god, comes to earth. Is this kind of sounding similar? Comes to earth and becomes a man. And he's like the champion, right? He's the hero. And so what you find in the story is, is that Hercules has to go through all of these things to, to become godlike. Again, we're going to talk more about that in a second. But as I watch the beginning of this, and I watch all of this unfold under Zeus's nose, you know what it made me think about Zeus? This guy's inept. How can he be the, the, the chief god of all of the Greek pantheon? How can this guy rule? If Hades can come in, sneak in with a couple of, of kind of idiot creatures and steal the baby right from under his nose and destroy everything, who is this guy? And it seemed to me like as I'm watching this unfold, this obviously, obviously the Greek myths are just uh, ludicrous. This guy can't be God. Because it seemed like he didn't have a plan for anything. Everything was happening to Zeus. And Zeus was affecting nothing. Zeus couldn't even get his son back. Did you know that in the story, it's hilarious. Zeus is kind of like twiddling his thumbs. Doesn't even know how to get his kid back. And I'm sitting here thinking about Christmas. And that if God would send his own son, there had to be a plan involved. Let me share with you a few scriptures as we go through this. We're going to go back about uh, 3,500 years, 1,500 years before Jesus, Moses. Listen to what God is, tells Moses about this plan. In Deuteronomy 18, 18, he said, I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen, your countrymen, just like you, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Do you know who he's talking about here? He's talking about Jesus. In John chapter 9, we actually see that this is who he's talking about. So fast forward to about 700 years before Jesus. We have the prophet Isaiah. And so notice what uh, the prophet Isaiah says about the Christ, this guy who's supposed to come. He says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And listen to what they're going to call this guy. We're going to call him Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. When you hear that, when you see that, that and, and this is just a couple of, of verses out of a, a lot of verses, God had a plan. When he sent Jesus Christ, it was for the purpose of Christ coming for a reason. Jesus in, in John chapter 10 said this in verse 17 and 18. He said, for this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Unlike Hercules sent to earth, trying to figure it out, Jesus had a plan. I lay down my life that I might take it up because no one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. The thing that Christmas, the first thing I want us to see is that Christmas teaches us that God has a plan an eternal plan, and a perfect plan. And within that plan, Christmas also teaches us that God must punish sin. Think about it. Think about it. What did Jesus do when he came to earth? The Bible says that he died. This is why it's so weird for when, when uh, after the, Jesus rose from the grave and the church was spreading all over the, the early Mediterranean uh, coast, 
What you found is that the Greeks didn't like this Jesus because if he was God, it was weird that he would die. Because if he's a God, he, that, that doesn't make any sense. And then the Jews didn't like it because if Jesus was God, why would he become a man? That makes no sense. And so for Jesus to come with the purpose of laying down his life tells us something about God punishing sin. If God would, would let his own son die, would let his own son die, would not spare him. What does that say about you and me? Think about it. If God's not going to spare Jesus, is he going to spare you? Christmas teaches us that God must deal with sin. Let me give you a couple of verses here. This one's actually found in Romans chapter 8, verse 32. It'll be on your screen. It says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? See, the idea is that God took your sin and my sin, placed it on Christ. He didn't spare Jesus from the punishment of sin, even though Christ was sinless. He did not spare his own son. Let me ask you guys this. Could you do that? Could you spare your own son? All of us have good punishment stories, I bet, right? You all have a, probably a good one. I've told this one before, but one of my favorite punishment stories of the beating that I got, as, one of the beatings I got as a kid, was uh, one summer I was pulling all the peach trees off of the peaches around our house, and me and a buddy were hitting them with baseball bats. And when you hit a peach with a baseball bat, the pit will go flying, like forever. And so we were playing kind of like a, home run derby and seeing who could hit the peaches over the barn. And we would hit these peaches and we would watch the pits go flying. And we were going from tree to tree to tree to tree, just stripping all the peaches off of all the trees. And when my parents finally got home, we were literally pulling the peaches off the last tree. And we had like seven or eight of them around our house. You can imagine not only the mess, but for a, a family who, you know, we don't do that. These are peaches. We make peach preserves. We give them to our friends. You don't strip the peaches of a summer's produce just to hit them with a baseball bat. And the reason I share that is because my parents did not spare even me. <laughs> even me. Look at this face. Dad, but I didn't know that it was going to upset you. Yeah. Yeah. So my point is, is that if God isn't going to spare his own son, how is he going to spare you? Somebody has to deal with sin. And God has designed actually two ways for sin to be dealt with. The first way for sin to be dealt with is for you to pay for what you've done. That you pay for what you've done. That you go. You say, I got this. I don't need anybody else. I can take care of myself. I've done wrong. It's like a basketball game. I raised my hand. I made the foul. That was on me. You pay for it. Go sit on the bench. Except in God's game, it's eternal. It's eternal separation from Him. Or the second way that He's done is through Jesus. And this is why Christmas is such a big deal. Because what Christ did when he came is that he made a way for you and for me to have this eternal punishment taken away from us. Imagine, same scenario, all the peaches off the tree, and yet someone else steps in as the belt comes off, right? What if my buddy who was there with me said, Mr. Wilson, you know, I'm going to do this. I'll take the punishment for Chris, right? What if that would have happened? That would have been awesome. <laughs> but it didn't. So these are God's two ways. Let me, let me share with you. This is in 1 Peter 3.18. This is what Christ did. It says, for Christ also died for sins. He died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust. You want to guess who's who in that scenario? The just Who's the just? Christ is the just. Who's the unjust? You. Me. We're the unjust. He said he died for the 
unjust so that he might bring us to God. Having been put to death in the flesh, he's made alive in the spirit. He lives. He rose from the grave. And so Christmas teaches us that God has a plan. It also teaches us God's going to deal with sin. But beyond that, it teaches us some really awesome things. It, it teaches us that God must love us a whole lot. He must love us a whole lot. I can't wait for tomorrow morning. Why do you think I can't wait for tomorrow morning? Presents. Amen, brother. <laughs> presents. But I'm not excited too much about my presence. And this is, I was having this conversation with my son or my daughter this morning as we were kind of shopping. You know, and I'm not really excited about my presence. And here's why. You know, when you get older, unfortunately, I just go buy what I want. Right? It's hard to buy for us because I'll just go. I was telling my kids this, don't worry about me. You know, let's get something for your mom here because I'll just go get what I want. I've got the checkbook. I can do that. And so I'm not really, I'm not looking forward to that. But you know what I'm looking forward to? This, I'm looking forward to my kids' faces. Oh, because we got some cool stuff this year. I can't wait to see how excited they are when they open up the gifts and they see what we've got for them. I'm excited for that. And you know what? When I, th when I think about Christmas and that Christ would come and give his life for us and give it freely as a gift. How, what a celebration it is when we open the gift. How much joy the Father must experience as I think about myself tomorrow and every Christmas as I'm watching my kids pull through the wrapping paper, how excited I'm going to be. How much more Excited Christ is when each of us turns to his love and he receives it. He must love us a lot. The Bible says in John 3.16, this is something we've all read, probably heard a thousand times, for God so loved the world that he gave his son. See, Christ, Christmas is, is about Christ coming because God gave him as a gift. He loved you and He gave Him as a gift that whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have eternal life. I love this verse. This is in Ephesians chapter 2. Speaking of God's love, it says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, He made us alive together with Christ. See, if God's going to be just and punish sin, if He's going to be, which we want Him to be, I hate to say it, but if God's not a just God, you don't want Him to be God. Because that means He's going to let evil do whatever evil wants to do. He's got to deal with it. But He's got to be loving. He's got to be filled with grace and filled with mercy and compassion and Christmas tells us that he is. And then the last thing I think that is most important, because oftentimes when we think about Christmas and we think about God and we think about all that Jesus did, when we begin to put all the, the pieces into the, the mix and we stir it up, there's probably a little pain that happens in our hearts as we mix it together. And you want to know what that is? Oftentimes I have these conversations with people and they'll tell me, yeah, but Chris, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I'm into. You don't know what my struggle is. Can I just, can I just tell everybody sitting here tonight, look around. Because you are made of flesh just like everybody else and everybody sitting in this room is going through so much too. There's not a person in this room who at Christmas time doesn't feel some form of pain. Whether it's from the loss of a loved one, whether it's from the struggle that they're going through, whether it's loneliness, whether it's sin, whether it's disease or anxiety or suffering or depression or whatever it is, there's not a person that doesn't hurt in this life. 
And oftentimes, as we mix this truth up, we'll say, yes, God is eternal. He is sovereign. He has, he's omniscient. He knows. He has a plan. And yes, he's got to deal with sin. I totally get it. And yes, Jesus, he must love me an awful lot to come and lay down his life. Not have it taken from me, but lay it down. He must love me an awful lot. But Chris, he's not going to love me. He can't love me that much because I've done some bad things. And this is my last point. I think this is what Christmas teaches us more than anything. It teaches us that God must be accessible. Another word you could write in there is approachable. He must be a God who we can go to. Why else would he put his son on the earth, fully God, fully man? Why would he do that? Just to walk around and, and be a good guy like Hercules? Just to, just to go through life and do some good things and be a superhero for us to uh, be inspired by? Is th- would you do that? Would you go through what Christ did just to inspire people? No. So Christ came so that he could bridge a gap and you can now have access to God even though you're broken and you're hurting and you've done some bad stuff. You know what I say? Welcome to the club. Welcome to the club. There's not a person in this room who's not been where you've been in some way. Let me give you a verse, and this, I'm going to end with this, and we're going, to, we're going to wrap this night up with a little bow. And I think this is... Uh, a very important thing for all of us to to talk about as we go into Christmas. And I want to leave us with this verse. This is found in Matthew chapter 11. I want you to listen to what Jesus says. He says, come to me. Stop right there. Do you hear that? So often at Christmas, we make it about everything and everyone else. And I want us just tonight to stop for a second. This is why you're here, whether you knew it or not. You're here because Jesus says, come to me. You're singing the songs, joy to the world, all hail King Jesus. We're singing these songs because Jesus is saying, come to me. And notice who he's looking for. Come to me, all you who are super strong and incredibly wealthy. And good looking. Because I need you on my team. Come to me all who are weary and burdened. And I will give you rest. (laughs) That is beautiful. That is the Christmas song we all need to sing. Thank you, Jesus, for rest. Thank you for carrying my burden. Thank you for caring about my weariness. He says, all of you take my yoke and learn from me because I'm gentle and humble in heart and, I, and you will find rest for yourself because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, we, we're here tonight as we, we talk about what, what, what great things it is what, what, what great things we experience at Christmas time. And, and what we don't need, often realize is that just like that dude in a Mustang, we need to look at what God would do for you. What kind of, what kind of being would go through all of this f- for you and for me? And see, we celebrate Christmas every year. And so oftentimes we walk away with no more than a, couple of gifts and a hangover maybe and Christ is going no 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 I'm accessible to you come come to me